the video on YouTube, uh, or alternatively, um, as a transcript uh, according to your preference. So uh, both are fine. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm fine with either. So whatever, whatever your preference is. Okay, excellent. Okay. Um, great. So my first question is um, that as a young person, you know, you're already pretty famous for just being really great at computer programming. Um, and I'm curious as to how your conception of technology has changed since your earliest days of coding. Um, and in this period of time, also how your views on politics have changed. Like since I was eight years old? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, it's changed a lot, right? Uh, when I was uh, eight years old, there wasn't such a thing as the World Web. Um, there was just 1989 or something. It would be still some time until the first web browser get uh, invented. So at the time, to me, uh, computer is very much like personal computing. Uh, the personal computer uh, revolution uh, was just starting. Uh, and a lot of that re resides on the idea that anything that I, I can do in the uh, day to day, um, for example, doing math or learning new languages and so on, a uh, computer can help me to, to do better. So I guess my earliest notion of computing uh, is that of assistive intelligence uh, in the sense of a assistive technology that assists me, but ultimately I decide the direction where I want the computing to go. Now, fast forward to today, um, we have seen that computing is not necessarily just helping out individuals anymore. I would argue that most of our online um, life isn't actually solo, isn't bringing what we have um, encountered in the previous personal computing era online. It's more social. Um, our video conferencing, for example, <laughs> where our attention is on each other rather than in any particular computation um, infrastructure. Uh, and the same goes for pretty much everything we used to be um, that's done in a solo way uh, is now more and more uh, social. It, it's as simple as starting a live stream, I guess, uh, for the world to participate in the your creation process, not just a product. And so um, I think uh, what used to be um, like clearly defined by the person doing the computing is now more and more also defined by the system that facilitates communication is as important as the computer itself. Uh, and if one is using, I don't know, Chromebooks or uh, things like that, maybe most of the computing isn't done uh, in the computer anymore. I think that's the biggest change. Mm, got it. That's really interesting, actually. Um, my my dad was like a computer scientist in the 70s when it was like a field that was very much mm -hmm. burgeoning. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if he would, I'm sure he would agree with you. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, he was working on like the arm chip and like all those devices that are very, very ancient compared to what we work with now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's really interesting though. Um, so I'm, I'm also curious, you're Taiwan's youngest ever cabinet appointee. Um, and basically your career in, in um, technology launched when you were very young. So I'm curious as to if you felt that people have doubted you ever or your abilities to serve in such a high place in government and if you've ever experienced any of your own self-doubt. Well, um, I'm actually the second youngest uh, appointee oh. and I was a uh, digital minister, I was 35. Uh, but a few years back when uh, Ms. Chen Li Jun uh, was first the uh, cabinet member in charge of youth development, uh, she was 34, uh, I think for mm -hmm. a few months, but she was by far the youngest. Um, and I mentioned Chen Li Jun uh, is, is, is very important because her work uh, mostly bringing in uh, youth engagement, bringing in the youth council, uh, introducing deliberative democracy uh, and citizens assembly and things like that uh, to the Taiwanese cabinet play a very uh, important role in paving the way. Um, and when I entered the cabinet, uh, she was the Minister of Culture. So we worked together to um, redefine what the term public infrastructure mean, because previously uh, in um, the olden days, um, the public money can either be spent on public infrastructure, which is considered investment, or on operation and maintenance, which is considered like ongoing spending, right? Uh, but when we're talking about we want to digitize um, the um, 
like the Taiwan uh, digital model library, the historic buildings and things like that into polygons um, using photogrammetry, videogrammetry and so on. Um, there's no tangible thing in it. Uh, and so um, the argument that it's digital public infrastructure is new to many people uh, because they, they previously would consider this as like everyday operation spending because there's no um, concrete, like literally concrete structure um, to uh, as a deliverable to such project but we say that because it's uh, creative commons um, everybody gets to use it it changes the discourse around these social objects people don't have to rely on second or third hand reports anymore everybody can feel it for themselves in those historic buildings and so on and so gradually uh, we did convince um, the older generations that this digital public infrastructure is as important or even more important um, than um, analog public infrastructure. So I, I don't think we, I've had any doubts, but that's because I've had really good colleagues uh, that are uh, similarly innovative and is willing to engage uh, the digital world. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so kind of actually transitioning more to questions um, about Taiwan's civic tech sector. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure that you've been interviewed plenty about Taiwan's COVID-19 response. Um, and I'm sure you've been asked this question many times, but overall, what lessons can other countries take away um, from Taiwan's response? And are there any other countries that are looking to partner with Taiwan to kind of share technology resources and, and general practices? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, during the COVID, we've had many exchanges, even a multilateral, like 14 economies exchange uh, that a few days before a uh, World House Assembly. Uh, and I think uh, the main idea of Taiwan model is a all of society model where the people, instead of just um, repeating or obeying top down instructions, are empowered in the sense that both uh, epidemiological uh, ideas are plentiful and people do understand it and also people are free to innovate to remix to um, as people in civic tech say to fork uh, whatever government uh, policies that are in place be it uh, mask distribution or it could be uh, using traditional rice cookers to to kill the virus but doesn't kill the mask or <laughs> there's many uh, interesting social innovations uh, that uh, just spread around and even very simple things like wear a mask not to respect the elderly or to protect the health workers, but wear a mask to protect your own face against your own unwashed hand. Um, this meme, uh, which uh, appeals to rational self-interest, uh, is also very important because people do spread it more uh, if they believe uh, and correctly, uh, especially at the beginning of the uh, pandemic, uh, where the uh, asymptomatic or airborne uh, transfers are not that well understood, at least it protects oneself against your unwashed hand, so there's less controversy or conspiracy theories. So that's, uh, I think, number one about empowering the social sector. And I think the second one, also very important, is for the government to give a account in a very predictable fashion uh, and that welcomes citizen input in the past year there's more than 2 million phone calls to the toll-free number 1922, each one asking either for a personalized, individualized explanation or actually contributing to the current COVID, like the young boy who called saying, um, you're wishing now a mask and we're getting only pink ones. Uh, the boys on the class all have navy blue ones. I don't want to wear pink to class and everybody um, on the next 2 p.m. Uh, press conference, everyone wore pink and pink became the most hip color and the boy became the most hip boy in the class. So the, the point here is a, a rapid iteration cycle and it could be done using not very cutting edge using essentially just two or three numbers and TV or radio and, and that's it. But a predictable uh, way for people to understand that their ideas get amplified within 24 hours. And if anything we uh, didn't do well, we just apologize and correct that within 24 hours. That's also very important. Mm, okay, I see. Something that um, you touched upon um, just now was using technology for social action mm -hmm. um, and something that I've read about in various articles is your Taoist approach to mm -hmm. political and social action. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm curious as to whether the role that spirituality for you, um, whether that role plays the same um, or, or whether it's the same in your professional life um, and your private life or if those are kind of distinct roles for spirituality. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm 
currently uh, doing this for fun, right? I'm optimized <laughs> for fun, so uh, there's no uh, real difference between the daytime and um, actually I do most of my work in, in my sleep anyway. So most of the, the daytime is just for listening and for, for communication. And the idea of a, a Taoist uh, approach is very simple. It's not to uh, do any you know top down, shut down, take down, lock down, <laughs> and that, that will um, increase the uh, what what they call um, the idea is is way way to to do without doing. So instead of do specific things, uh, make spaces so that each and every one of citizens are able to then innovate uh, without uh, me or really any official being the bottleneck of uh, innovation being spread and so on. So uh, like fostering a co-creative space, I think that's the main thing I learned from the Taoist approach. Yeah, it's, I guess, spiritual, but it's also very practical and secular. Mm, I see, I see, that makes sense. Um, I want to ask you now about V Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm curious as to kind of throughout the process of building this open source software, um, what was kind of the most illuminating aspect for you of building the program or the platform? And what important like governmental issues do you see it being instructive for in the future? Mm -hmm. Well, V-Taiwan uh, is now, uh, well, it's always run by the social sector. So as soon as I became digital minister in 2016, October, I handed uh, the root passwords and things like that. So uh, it's been quite a while. I can't really speak for the project anymore. Uh, but uh, I think uh, still to this day, uh, like V-Taiwan is being used to deliberate the Open Parliament National Action Plan by the legislature. Um, and also, uh, I think uh, many new ideas like social entrepreneurship, whether one should legalize that and so on, uh, the V-Taiwan team is still uh, tackling that using a mixture of uh, online agenda setting and face-to-face -face, but also live streamed um, deliberation. So um, I think one thing stayed constant uh, since I was more in charge of V-Taiwan in 2015 uh, to now is that the online and face-to-face -face components, they are not um, canceling each other out. It's not a uh, substitutive or replacement uh, relationship. Rather Rather, um, the online part is best to explore the agenda because online, uh, especially asynchronously, people get more time to reflect uh, on each other's feelings. Uh, but uh, online is very hard to get to the actual deliberation. So we always um, arrange a face-to-face -face deliberation and hold us only to uh, the online determined um, co-created rough consensus as the agenda and only explores such aspects that are already identified as uh, like livable, um, as that uh, the people could live with it, and which is surprisingly many, uh, and without over focusing on the ideological or the divisive part that's identified by, say, the police um, mechanism. So, yeah, I think the, the rule of thumb simply is to um, discover, to explore in online, but to converge, uh, to define together uh, face to face. Mm, okay. Something you, you just mentioned was the idea of rough consensus. Mm -hmm. And I've read about your thoughts on that before, but I'm curious, can you just kind of sum up um, your thoughts surrounding rough consensus and why that's important for a country? Sure. Um, so rough consensus uh, is an idea from internet governance where people like hum alone uh, and uh, get a feeling uh, of each other's resistance uh, to any particular idea. But uh, I think the main idea of rough consensus is to, as contrast to uh, the traditional way that the word consensus is used. Uh, consensus is usually used to mean something that's a fine consensus, mean that we can all sign our name on it. The problem is that uh, when people um, get online, especially when they don't share many of the first time experiences, it's actually very difficult to get to that fine consensus. Usually um, the people with most time uh, on their hands win the argument, I guess. Uh, but if one is just uh, aiming for rough consensus, meaning that we can live with it, then we're really not talking about a concrete solution that's accepted by everyone, but rather um, a shared value out of those different positions. So for example, uh, in 2015's UberX case, instead of um, 
debating endlessly whether that's sharing economy or platform economy or gig economy or whatever um, we, we instead just focus on the specific case of someone driving to work and back and picking up a stranger even though that someone doesn't have a professional driver's license um, and turns out that everyone including uh, professional drivers amateur drivers and so on all agree that the passenger insurance the registration not undercutting existing meters and so on these are the shared values uh, despite the very different ideological definition on quote unquote sharing economy so this is a sense of shared values without going to all the way uh, to like find consensus with prescribed solutions mm, i see okay and i guess from the perspective of someone um living in taiwan someone who supports the idea of rough consensus um what do you think are america's um hopes for achieving rough consensus i know that's a very broad question but as you probably know there's a lot of polarization in this country um we're much larger than taiwan and um you know there's a huge spectrum of um backgrounds religions um you know ethnicities there's a lot of polarization um, so I'm curious, do you think that countries can emulate rough consensus as well as Taiwan already has? Well, in 2014, uh, the Taiwanese cabinet only had a citizen approval rate of around 9%. I don't think the U.S. has ever sunk this low <laughs> in terms of trustworthiness uh, of government. Uh, and people were very, very polarized. Um, and I, I think the, the main thing, though, is, is not to concentrate on the parts that are polarized. Like in Taiwan, we've had many elections since our democratization. Uh, we had one where the uh, winning uh, president gets uh, like barely 40% uh, of votes out of three candidates. Uh, we had one where it's like literally 51%, 49%. Uh, so, so I think we were no um, stranger to polarization. Uh, and, and the point of uh, doing the rough consensus platforms such as the POLIS that I mentioned, uh, the joint platform, uh, many other platform, presidential hackathon, uh, sandbox, um, and also uh, participatory budgeting and so on, it is to focus on a different picture of the population um, there's many people who look at the police report for the first time and saw that even though there's maybe 5% of statements that divide the country, there's actually 95% of statements that everybody more or less identify with. Um, that's a very powerful image. Uh, and it's been repeated in the U.S. as well, in Bowling Green, Kentucky, if you look at a, um, like a citizens' assembly, a virtual citizens' assembly report, you see exactly the same uh, structure where people... Uh, no matter we're like Republican or Democrat or Libertarian or whatever, um, all agree that uh, we need to put uh, art into STEM education because it's also creative and also diversify our broadband access so it's more inclusive uh, and so on. So there are a lot uh, like concrete points that's uh, really unrelated to political ideologies. The importance is that whether we have a digital public infrastructure to reflect this basic fact um, to the citizenry or whether we misuse the private digital infrastructures like Facebook and so on, which are really like nightclubs with their private bouncers and addictive drinks and things like that, and, and like misuse it as a place for public deliberation, which it's probably not the best tool for doing so. Mm, interesting. So overall, your, your take on technology seems to be broadly positive and optimistic. Um, and I would say, you know, many people would probably say that technology has failed society. Um, mm -hmm. we've spoken about disinformation and polarization. Um, some people also point to how the news industry has kind of been decimated, um, by social media and just technology as a whole. Mm -hmm. Um, so do you believe that these critics are right and, or, or are you more optimistic and, Kind of what fuels this optimism but also mm -hmm. what do you think that governments and the private se sector can do to address problems that technology does have mm -hmm. well both of my parents are journalists so of course i support local journalism uh, but i don't think internet was invented to boost internet journalism uh, i mean it's a worthy goal and i'm happy to work on it but internet is 
far as I understand, designed to remain communication uh, in a civilization after a nuclear fallout. That's its original design spec. Uh, and in, in that, uh, Internet probably didn't fail the society. I mean, amid lockdowns and so on, we still managed to get a lot of things done thanks to video conferencing and other technologies. With that said, I, I do think uh, that the so-called social media, which I sometimes refer to as anti-social media, um, is having a very adverse uh, effect on the quality of uh, not just political discourse, but also on the basic ability to generate uh, facts. Um, because journalism, um, science, research, um, a lot of things like public deliberation and so on are supposed to generate facts in a way that everyone can participate. But nowadays, uh, through the more anti-social corners of social media, at uh, the same attention span that could be um, used for you know, fact checking and digital competency and contributing to your local news and so on are being uh, <laughs> repurposed uh, to amplify the most polarized and the most toxic uh, part of the uh, discourse. And it's not even public anymore because it's very questionably public interested. So um, I think the solution here is not to go back to um, like, I don't know, dial up. <laughs> I don't really think that that magically <laughs> solves things. I, I don't think it's a broadband issue. I, I do think um, it is a asymmetry issue if uh, we have broadband as a human right, as we do here in Taiwan. Uh, we make sure that everyone enjoy like 10 megabits, both uplink and downlink, and use it um, in a more symmetric way. The, the point is that if one used the social media or the internet, uh, you know, just downloading 10 megabits per second, but uploading only one bit, which is called like, uh, I, I guess you know, it's two bits now or three, uh, they're like five bit different emotions. But um, I, I mean, it, it's very asymmetric and it's essentially like uh, amplifying the worst of radio and television without the kind of public spectrum accountability that uh, people used to have over those radio and television. So as I think the solution is digital competence, um, which is why in our curriculum we don't say media literacy anymore, we say media competence, emphasizing that each uh, school children, each middle school student is free to contribute not only to environment science and local news, but also fact checking the three presidential candidates or they can, I don't know, take a, a film of of the local uh, tallying process uh, and, and so on uh, of uh, elections and so on. So uh, once everyone see ourselves as media and uh, see things through the lens of media, then people could use the uplink much more than uh, many corners of the world currently do. And that I think uh, will deepen the democracy by giving the democracy uh, more bits of source uh, checked information to work with. Mm. That's interesting. I haven't heard this distinction between social media and anti-social media. I really mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, it could be pro-social too, right? It's a matter of choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about disinformation. Um, I have one last question about that. So um, can you speak to specific examples of disinformation that have been spread in Taiwan by China? Um, and can you speak to how Taiwanese citizens harness technology in these instances to, you know, find proof that China was the culprit and also just to combat the misinformation? Sure. Um, so one example was uh, in November 2019, uh, and it's, it's not even covert, it's very overt. Uh, and you can check it out in the Taiwan Fact Check Center. I think it's uh, the fact check number is... Um, 204, 204. Uh, and, and I quote, the, the disinformation is, and I quote, Hong Kong thugs compensation exposed, killing a police earns those teenagers up to 20 million, end of quote. Um, and the interesting thing is that it's actually based on a real photo. It's a Reuters photo uh, with some young people participating in the Hong Kong protest, uh, and which is shaping up to be around the end of 2019, the defining issue of the presidential election in Taiwan. Um, and so uh, the caption, which was just saying there was teenagers in the protest, um, was recaptioned 
uh, into uh, a variety of mixes such as and I quote, uh, this 13-year-old Zuck bought new iPhones and game consoles and is recruiting his brothers, unquote. Uh, and, and there's many variations such as this. And so we, we didn't take anything down, just as we find a pandemic with no lockdown, we find an infodemic with no administrative takedowns. Instead, uh, what we did is that partnering with the International Fact-Checking Network, uh, so Taiwan Fact-Check Center is one chapter uh, in it, um, did a fact-check really quickly and said that, oh, this actually is a wrong caption. The Reuters photo didn't say anything like that. And a uh, uh, bad caption uh, originally came from the Weibo account of Zhongyang Zhengfawei Chang'an Jian, the Chang'an sort Weibo account of the central um, political and law unit of the CCP, of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and, and this is uh, interesting because uh, this approach of what I call notice and public notice as opposed to notice and takedown actually uh, inoculates people for vaccine is just um, that virus, I guess. So, um, because people still share that on the social media, but uh, the anti-social media is made more pro-social by a um, very clear uh, marker that says, this is state-sponsored uh, disinformation campaign. Uh, click here for the fact check. But we didn't take anything down. And people come to understand that there is a Beijing-sponsored uh, media campaign, disinformation campaigns uh, related to the Hong Kong protests. So this is just one example. There, there are many, but uh, they're mostly on the uh, Taiwan Fact Checking uh, Center website, which is a social sector um, organization and not at all sponsored or directed uh, by the government. They check, uh, they fact check us all the time too. Mm, very cool, very cool. I will be sure to to you know check check that out. Um, and I do have a follow up question to that, um, which is that how has kind of Taiwan's general um, open government policy made hard to find material more easy to ask access? Um, and then kind of what is the information that is most demanded by the public? Like what information are people most interested in finding given that they have, you know, such a capability to do so? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, their own information, of course. <laughs> the the, uh, the top downloaded app uh, last year in both iOS and Google Play uh, is the National Health Insurance app uh, or the NHI Express, Jianbao Kuai Yi Dong in Mandarin. Uh, and that's where uh, people could, after logging in, see all the um, dentist visits, uh, traditional uh, medicine visits, um, you know, doctor visits, x ray, I think CT scans. Too. Uh, so basically any medical record that's held by any uh, clinic that's uh, covered by the NHI, which is pretty much everyone, uh, is in that app and people could very easily download the data as well as uh, even dedicate the mask rationing quota that they, they don't need to international humanitarian aid uh, or things like that. So, so this is much more than um, downloading public information. This is uh, a data coalition where each and every citizen is in charge of how to make use of the personal data that they have stored on the national health insurance. And the point here is that with, um, I think, one quarter of population now uh, using this app um, and dedicating their um, quotas to international humanitarian aid and also participating uh, in studies uh, such as diabetes and so on by authorizing uh, through a SDK uh, third party researchers uh, they, that they trust uh, will make use of their data well without you know targeted advertising or anything like that. Uh, I think this shapes a, a new way that the citizens control the production of the data, not just the consumption of the public data. Of course, we also do public data download uh, very well, like the real-time mask availability in the 6,000 pharmacies. Uh, that's, of course, very popular. But I think in terms of the time people spend on data, definitely the, the personal data, the, what we call my data, um, is more than uh, open data. I see. Got it. It's very cool to me. <laughs> um, and I think I mentioned before, but kind of how I got to know about your work is through listening to a podcast episode about civic hackers. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious, why are there so many civic hackers in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. um, and what incentivizes these hackers to maybe forego high paying like tech sector jobs mm -hmm. to 
instead work on, you know, promoting democracy and working towards social causes. Mm -hmm. Well, these are definitely not competing interests. Um, there's many uh, very high paying people, um, yours truly included before I joined the cabinet, uh, that dedicate their, their weekends or even some weekdays uh, into um, the public infrastructure uh, work for, for digital democracy. And this is because, not just because out of a sense of fun or a sense of passion, but also it has very concrete rewards if um, during a HR interview, uh, someone said uh, that, hey, you, you probably uh, have used the work that I've done uh, because uh, your child is, um, you know, learning uh, Mandarin and uh, Mandarin dictionary uh, is collaboratively done by people in Cup Zero. Uh, chances are that their recruitment will go much more smooth because they essentially contribute a very, very high profile and um, like loved by many um, thing uh, that the government wasn't doing very well in the beginning and the citizen, the civic hackers forked and did very well. Uh, the same goes for for climate science uh, and for pretty much everything really. Like this information management, if someone applied for a job to the Trent Micro, Taiwan's leading antivirus company and said, hey, I've contributed to the bot that um, did the disinformation real-time fact-checking in chat rooms, they probably get hired uh, in real time. Actually, that happened already with uh, the COVAX uh, teams uh, that there's a fork of that bot called Mei Yu Yi, who, which got acquired by, by Husko, uh, which is again a, a really uh, fast growing startup. So there's an ecosystem. Uh, and if you solve a problem that has broad public appeal, uh, it's probably also solving worldwide problems. And that gives you much better access to the worldwide um, network as well. So, so I would say it's still entrepreneurship. Uh, it's just social entrepreneurship. Uh, things that, you know, doesn't destroy democracy, but rather repair democracy um, as part of the entrepreneurship. So, so that's uh, the gist uh, of why people develop so, so many times, because they see a exit, not necessarily to um, the public listing of IPO, but mm -hmm. exit to a community which is uh, very much thriving and worldwide. I see. So, you know, you've had extensive experience both in the business sector, but also in government. and kind of as a follow-up to your last answer, um, is it your belief that these two shouldn't work in silos, that they should be very much in interconnected? Mm -hmm. Well, my, my idea is called people-public-private partnership. So the social sector, such as Gov Zero uh, or the Taiwan Fact Check Center and so on, should uh, set the norms. And then the public sector, the government, need to amplify those norms so that uh, it has democratic legitimacy legitimacy and is maintained uh, for consistency by the career public service. And then the private sector, the business sector can work on scaling it out. So instead of just scaling it up, uh, which is giving it democratic legitimacy uh, and making sure that it uh, works on, for example, national issues, not just one particular district uh, in the social sector. Um, the private sector can then package that as solutions uh, and that can just I don't know, helped a worldwide community uh, and also make a uh, useful um, like addendum uh, to the data collection, data production and things like that. There's a business around that. But the importance uh, is that the norm is set by the social sector, not the other way around, where in many like private part public uh, and no people partnerships is, is the private sector uh, setting the norms and the public sector kind of forced uh, because they don't have uh, any choice uh, to use the rules already set by the private sector to conduct as I mentioned like town hall deliberation on a private sector infrastructure that's definitely not meant uh, for that use and then the social sector uh, will be weakened including the local news and journalism and things like that so like just flipping that around uh, mm -hmm. and having the social sector setting the uh, rules of engagement, I think would make for much better uh, cross-sectoral collaboration. Very cool, very interesting. Um, and so my last question actually um, mm -hmm. is focused on e-governance mm -hmm. and um, kind of what has Taiwan done already to strengthen e-governance? Um, and then, you know, looking towards the future, how will kind of smart technologies be harnessed to help with challenges such as like, you know, the aging population, um, assimilating new immigrants, fostering economic connections. Just curious as to 
how mm-hmm. e-governance will grow in the future. Sure. Um, yeah, it's like uh, nowadays we say uh, I'll mail you. You probably automatically prefix that with a e dash, right? We don't say e dash mail anymore. Uh, and so when the national participation platform joined the gov.tw uh, has more than 10 million visitors uh, a couple of years back, uh, we, we dropped the e from e participation. <laughs> we just call it the, the participation platform because once you have more than half of adult population uh, using the platform, and uh, and also for the non adults. Uh, listening, uh, we have more than one quarter of petitions started by people who are not even 18 years old. So um, I, I think um, it's, I think the point is that people could assume that broadband is a human right, it's very affordable, just 16 US dollars per month for unlimited data. Uh, and only then, only when we have this inclusivity, can we uh, truly say that this is uh, just governance, this is not e dash governance. Uh, and so that's what we have already done. Now, looking forward, um, I think uh, what we are now doing is to make democracy itself a type of civic technology, which is really quite radical, but it's um, easier, I guess, in Taiwan because we're, we're very young. So we, we can afford to change our constitution. I think we're on the seventh or eighth change now uh, and uh, probably going to be a referendum for constitutional change soon. Um, and and the, the point is that if people think of democracy as a fossilized ritual, uh, then they will spend more time on other things and not on democracy. And as a result, public decision will suffer. But if people who are the most creative ones apply whatever they have learned, like from Ethereum, blockchain governance, uh, and translate that directly to democracy, like with quadratic voting, which we've done for the past two presidential hackathons and so on, uh, then we effectively increase the bandwidth democracy in taking full advantage of whatever the broadband as a human rights uh, condition that the society currently uh, enjoy. And so we're not restricted to just three bits per four years per person, which is called voting, uh, and could then afford to uh, tackle much more structural um, issues by the way of rough consensus and running code. This time code means actually a legal code. Um, so um, having the democracy itself as a social object, as a type of technology that even um, 16 years old or 13 years old can contribute meaningfully, I think that's a general direction. Yeah. Mm, very good direction to go in, that's for sure. Um, great, well, I wanna thank you for your time again. Mm-hmm. Um, I find your work very inspiring. I'm sure people all around the world do. Um, so yeah, I very much enjoyed um, being able to talk to you. I will mm-hmm. send you the link when the article is published. Mm-hmm. Um, have you been recording this meeting as well? No, uh, but I can just use your recording because Skype okay. is both ways. Uh, but if you want, uh, I can also uh, send a local audio to you. But I, I don't know whether the audio quality was good or not for you. Um, it was pretty good. I recorded with my phone just as backup, but oh, okay. I wouldn't mind having a third backup if you want to send okay. me. Right, so do I need to embargo the publication of the video until you publish? Uh, does that mean like not release it? No, I, I mean you, you said you're, you're publishing uh, a, a write-up, right? Uh, I and will so publish some like a transcript. Yeah, some, some journalists prefer uh, that I publish the video after they publish the transcript, but it's all up to you. Uh, I can just publish it to YouTube right now if uh, you're okay with that. I'm totally fine with that. Yeah, oh, that excellent. works great for me. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you for the yeah. contribution to the comments. Of uh, course, yeah, and I admire that, you know, mm-hmm. everything is so open and accessible and that I was able to, able to contact you so easily as well. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. thank you so much, Audrey. It was a pleasure talking. Thank you. Live long and prosper. Bye. Oh, you too. Bye.